Good evening, I'm Paul Fraser and this is the latest news from Bahrain International. His Royal Highness the Prime Minister, Prince Khalifa bin Salman Al Khalifa, received at Gunabia Palace today the Council of Commissioners of the National Institute for Human Rights, that's the NIHR, led by Dr. Abdulaziz Abu. His Royal Highness has directed that media methods should keep in pace with Bahrain's achievements and introduce to the world national legal accomplishments. His Royal Highness was presented with the 2015 to 2016 annual reports of the NIHR and commended the implementations to develop human rights by making use of international expertise, in addition to communicating Bahrain's accomplishments with specialised agencies. The Prime Minister asserted that the government has comprehensive human rights principles, outlining that all citizens must enjoy the full rights of living with dignity, safely and securely, provided with quality living standards and services. He noted that human rights values in Bahrain are reinforced and protected, asserting that Bahrain is always keen to strengthen cooperation with all international institutions so as to reinforce its status and make the principles of human rights a public culture in both society and government action. For his part, Dr. Abu expressed honour to present His Royal Highness the Prime Minister with the reports commending his directives in regards to the development of human rights and praised the government's support to all national efforts that promote human rights values. His Royal Highness the Prime Minister, Prince Khalifa bin Salman Al Khalifa, received at Gunabia Palace today the Gulf Press Union, led by the Editor-in-Chief of the Saudi newspaper Al Jazeera and Union Secretary-General Nasser Al Othman, on the occasion of the Union's sixth conference hosted by the Kingdom of Bahrain. His Royal Highness affirmed that the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia is the strongest ally for Arab and Islamic nations. He noted the success of the Union and used the United Arab Emirates as an example for its success. He also stated that he looks forward to a Gulf Union that reinforces cooperation. The Prime Minister pointed out that GCC leaders have been paying attention to the challenges currently facing the region and have succeeded in protecting the nations. During the meeting, His Royal Highness praised the high status of the Gulf press in enlightening public opinion and defending the rights of Gulf citizens while standing against attempts of intrusion and schemes aimed at distorting achievements. The Prime Minister noted the Union's approach and high standards reached, praising the efforts exerted by the journalists. His Royal Highness affirmed that the latest events and developments in the world require a high degree of vigilance and conscientiousness, journalists who work towards public awareness and enlightenment. For their part, the Union members expressed pride in His Royal Highness's support of journalism and praised his keenness for the Union's objectives. They also noted the wise vision of the Prime Minister, commending his role and achievements in Bahrain's development and progress.
The representative of His Majesty the King for Charity Work and Youth Affairs, Chairman of the Supreme Council for Youth and Sports and President of Bahrain Olympic Committee, His Highness Sheikh Nasser bin Hamad Al Khalifa, patronised the annual ceremony of the Ministry of Youth and Sports Affairs held at the Four Seasons Hotel. The ceremony was attended by the Minister of Youth and Sports Affairs, Hisham bin Mohammed Al Jowda, the Ministry's Assistant Under Secretaries, Heads of Departments and Employees, as well as representatives and Shura Council members. Sheikh Nasser affirmed that the substantial achievements of the Ministry in 2016 were the result of diligent work to implement the vision of the Supreme Council for Youth and Sports Affairs, aimed at improving the youth and sports movement in the Kingdom. He added that the Ministry's achievements were thanks to His Majesty King Hamid bin Isa Al Khalifa's wise directives and support. His Highness also attributed the achievements to the support of His Royal Highness the Prime Minister, Prince Khalifa bin Salman Al Khalifa, and His Royal Highness the Crown Prince, Deputy Supreme Commander, and First Deputy Premier, Prince Salman bin Hamad Al Khalifa. Sheikh Nasser expressed pride in being alongside the Ministry's employees during the ceremony and in the absence of any violations by the Ministry in the annual audit report, which reflects the employees' keenness in abiding by the law. He honoured the teams that contributed to the achievements of the Ministry as well as the Ministry's Employee of the Year. Mr Al Jowda then gave a presentation about the Ministry's achievements throughout 2016. The Shura Council held its 13th meeting of the third session of the fourth legislative term under the chairmanship of the Council's Speaker, Ali bin Salah Al Salah. The Council discussed the remaining articles of the Public Health Draft Law. It also discussed the reports of the Services Committee about the draft law, where it approved the Committee's recommendations on articles discussed during the session. Except for an amendment suggested during the meeting, the session was briefed on the Shura Council's delegation to the consultative meeting of the Association of Senates, Shura and Equivalent Councils in Africa and the Arab World, which was held in Addis Ababa. The Council also heard a report from the delegation on the launch of the Middle East and North Africa chapter of the Parliamentary Network on the World Bank and International Monetary Fund in Tunis. Chief of Terror Crime Prosecution Advocate General Ahmed Al Hamadi announced that three inmates convicted on proven charges of killing First Lieutenant Tariq Mohammed Al Shehi, Policeman Mohammed Raslan and Amr Abdu Ali Mohammed were executed this morning. The Chief of Terror Crime Prosecution, Advocate General Ahmed Al Hamadi, said the execution of the three inmates was carried out after the Court of Cassation rejected the appeals of the defendants and upheld their death sentences. The legally prescribed measures were taken, and the public prosecutor requested the implementation of the verdict. The execution, implemented by a firing squad, took place in the presence of a judge, public prosecution representatives, the prison commandant, a physician, and a preacher, as stipulated by the law. The crime took place on March the 3rd of 2014, when the defendants planted an explosive device, lured the policemen and detonated it, killing the three policemen and injuring 13 others. The investigations conducted by the public prosecution proved that the suspects had formed their terrorist group within the Saraya al-Ashtar or al-Ashtar Brigade's terror group and succeeded in recruiting the other suspects, particularly those with experience in making and using explosives. They plotted to carry out terrorist attacks against security forces and to target security and vital installations in the kingdom. They managed to make explosive devices and prepared them for this purpose. 
The defendants held several meetings and devised a plan to achieve the goals of their group. As part of their terrorist plan, they agreed to take advantage of a funeral on the 3rd of March of 2014, during which police forces would be stationed nearby to maintain order. They planned to place improvised explosive devices, or IEDs, equipped with remote detonation devices in different locations in the site and to lure policemen to the places of the explosives and detonate them and inflict the maximum number of deaths among the forces. To implement their terrorist plot, the suspects planted three IEDs on the highway the evening before the crime. According to the plan, members were tasked with detonating the device, others with monitoring the area, and one with recording the explosions. On the 3rd of March of 2014, they carried out their plot, starting with staging riots to lure the policemen. A terror group member, sentenced to death, took up his place atop a building and detonated the explosive device. The explosion resulted in the death of three victims, first Lieutenant Tariq al-Shahi and policeman Mohammed Raslan and Ammar Abu Ali Mohammed, and the injury of 13 others. The other two IEDs were not detonated, as one was impacted by the first explosion and the policemen did not get close to the place where the other had been placed. Six suspects were charged with joining the terror group. They, along with a second suspect, carried out terrorist activities, killed and attempted to kill policemen, damaged public properties and possessed, stored, handled and used explosive substances. Their aim was to carry out acts of terror, fund their terror group and finance its activities. The defendants challenged the verdict at the Court of Cassation. Their lawyers also presented memoranda explaining the reasons for challenging the court's rulings. The High Criminal Court deliberated the case and sentenced three defendants to death and the remaining suspects to life in prison. Some of the defendants had their nationalities revoked. The verdicts were later upheld by the Court of Appeals. The public prosecution referred the case to the Court of Cassation in accordance with Article 40 of the Court of Cassation Law, promulgated by Decree 8 of 1989, which stipulates that death sentences are automatically referred to the Court of Cassation. The Court of Appeals deliberated the case a second time and upheld the sentence in view of the incontestable material and verbal evidence and referred it to the Court of Cassation, which upheld the death and jail sentences. The Court of Cassation deliberated the case and the defendant's appeals on the 17th of October of 2016, cancelled the sentence and referred it back to the Court of Appeals to consider it anew, based on the fact that the verdict issued by the Court of Appeals on upholding the death penalty was not taken unanimously by the judges, as stipulated by Article 260 of the Penal Code. In implementation of the decision of the Court of Cassation, the Court of Appeals deliberated the case a second time on the 4th of December of 2016 and unanimously upheld the sentence by the first court. On the 9th of January of 2017, the appeals by the defendants were again reviewed by the Court of Cassation in compliance with the provisions of the law. The court upheld the initial ruling and therefore the death penalty sentence handed down to the three main defendants became final. The Attorney General affiliated with the Public Prosecutor's Technical Office, Harun al Zayani, stated that the final death penalty sentence upheld against the convicts indicted in the day of bomb blast was based on compelling evidence. His statement was issued in the aftermath of the execution of the convicts who were sentenced to capital punishment in connection with the explosion which claimed the lives of an officer and two other policemen on March 3, 2014. He said that the evidence included the witnesses' testimonies, the convicts' own confessions, the material tools and telecommunication devices which were found with the executed convicts and others. Results of forensic reports also corroborated with the verbal testimonies, material evidence, as well as the circumstances that surrounded the deadly Dea explosion. The High Criminal Court took into consideration the compelling detailed evidence in issuing the death verdict which was upheld respectfully by the High Court of Appeals and then by the Court of Cassation. The Court of First Instance and the Court of Appeals based the death penalty sentence on material evidence which implicated without any presumption of doubt the defendants in the crimes. The convicts were caught with materials and substances which are used in making the lethal explosions. Human cells collected from one bomb which was diffused at the scene of the blast were found to be matching with the DNA of one of the executed convicts. Forensic examination of the mobile telephones revealed that the convicts used a special program in their communications. The recorded conversations revealed that the trio used the same program during the days before the blast. They also used the same program when perpetrating their crime, either to coordinate or to monitor the policemen's movements before targeting the security forces. 
The investigation revealed that the two mobile phones which were used in detonating the bomb that targeted the security forces had been tested the night before the blast, with the full knowledge of one of the convicts near the house of another convict. The reports submitted by the coroner and the forensic experts matched with the convict's confessions regarding the nature of the substances which were used to make the bomb and the technique used for the detonation. Some defence lawyers sought in their pleadings to challenge the confessions and consider them null and void, claiming that they were made under duress. The High Criminal Court and the High Court of Appeals dismissed the defence lawyers' claims as unsubstantiated, affirming that the convicts gave their confessions of their own accord and free will. The Court of Cassation upheld the death penalty, ruling that the confessions, which were substantiated by compelling evidence, were not obtained under duress. The case deliberations were held, respectively, at the High Criminal Court, two different instances of the High Court of Appeals. It was also deliberated twice before the Court of Cassation, which upheld the final verdict. The convicts received fair public trials and all legal guarantees in the presence of their lawyers, who had access to the case before delivering their pleadings. Twelve judges handled the case during the different stages of judicial litigation and found the evidence compelling, dismissing any presumed doubt and finding no reason to grant the convicts mercy or commute the death penalty. Foreign Affairs Minister Sheikh Khalid bin Ahmed bin Mohammed Al Khalifa took part in the International Peace Conference held in the French capital, Paris. In a speech he delivered in the conference, Sheikh Khalid affirmed Bahrain's support of the French peace initiative and all efforts aimed at resolving the Palestinian cause, as well as enabling the brotherly Palestinian people to rake in their legitimate rights and establish their independent state on the borders of 1967, with its capital being East Jerusalem. He added that these measures must be in accordance with the relevant international resolutions in addition to the Arab Peace Initiative of 2002, which provides a framework of just and comprehensive resolution. He also expressed his aspirations that the current peace efforts would result in a two-state solution, existing side by side in peace and ending occupation of all Arab land. The Foreign Affairs Minister welcomed United Nations Security Council's adoption of Resolution No. 2334 that demands Israel to halt all its settlement activity in the occupied Palestinian land. He called on the international community to commit to the two-state solution and to continue efforts of compelling the Israeli side to all requirements of the peace process in order for security and stability to prevail in the region. Sheikh Khalid bin Ahmed thanked the French government and expressed his appreciation for the kind efforts it exerts for the establishment of peace in the Middle East. The Bahrain International Expo 2017, consisting of four exhibitions under one roof, concluded yesterday. Here's Sheikh Mohammed with more on the story. The Beauty Expo is one of the most important exhibitions that provides individuals with all their health and beauty needs in a time when people are doing everything they can to improve the way they look. International and regional exhibitors participated with all kinds of buyers, retailers, importers, exporters, distributors and medical professionals of all sectors. Uh, we are a Denta Derma Center. Uh, it's a combination between dermatology and dentistry. We cover, uh, let's say, aesthetic dent uh, dermatology. Uh, in dentistry, we cover all fields. Like cosmetic dentistry, we are um, really, uh, like we have the signature for this uh, specialization. Uh, we have orthodontics, we have endodontists, we have uh, implants and general, conservative, all dental fields with really excellence, I can assure you that. I'm the owner and the clinical dietitian in Diet Delight. Uh, we'd really uh, love everyone to join in the exhibition for these three days to give them exactly what we do and what we provide in the community, uh, helping people lose weight and eat great. After working for over 15 years in Bahrain, I came to realize that there was a lack for good professional skincare places that can take care of your skin and look after your skin without visiting a doctor. So the concept of establishing a medical spa in Bahrain came to mind. And that's where Derma One NK Medical Spa 
came to uh, exist in th three years now in Bahrain and I'm proud to say it is the first medical spa in Bahrain. It is simply provides you with a medical grade treatment for all patients who look for a skin care but a professional one. Bahrain is a multinational kingdom with many organizations that offer vast selections of health and beauty services and products to the public. The expo was the perfect place for all of these to be on display. The Bahrain International Expo 2017 was the first of its kind in a very interesting concept. For Bahrain News, I'm Shogun Mohammed.